So, Rob, when did you first realise that you wanted to be a drummer? Oh, forever, really. You know, we all have hobbies, don't we? And when I was a when I was a kid, I mean, talking quite young, really, I remember we all put posters in our bedrooms, don't we? So I had I had uh, D- Buddy Rich, Keith Moon, Black Sabbath posters, and also at the same time I had Pike, Monster Pike, and Cart pictures on in my bedroom. So I've always been interested in those two things, and I remember thinking as a young lad. Somebody said, what do you want to do when you grow up, Rob? And I said, well, I want to be a professional fisherman who plays the drums. And obviously everybody laughed, but do you know what? I was. You've done it. I was. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a great story. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, we're actually doing a live show and I'm at Rutland Water. Um, it's a fantastic day. It's the end of September and the temperature's about going to be going up to about 18 or 19, 20 degrees. Looking out over the water, I can see a couple of fishing boats. Um, and I'm with a very special guest. Um, we just tell you, tell you about this guest in a minute, but we actually met at a... We both got something in common. We're both musicians. And we met at Castle Bythe Music Festival playing in bands. And we got talking. And I found out that Rob had played with a famous band at some point, which we'll talk about a bit more in detail. But the other thing that Rob has been very, very, spent a lot of his life doing is fishing. So he well, he very kindly invited me over to his house in Rutland Water. Um, and here we are. So I'm with Mr. Rob Waddington. Hello, Rob. Welcome to the show. Hello, Bob. Nice to see you. Thank- Welcome to my little abode here. It's not quite in Rutland Water. It's virtually in it, but it's just on the shores here, on the North Shore, looking over to a little bay called Bick Dickinson's Bay, if you can see the... Oh, look at those cormorants and there's, there's a fishing boat there. So, yeah, nice to see you, Bob. And thank you ever so much for coming on the show. So how, how long have you lived here then, Rob? I've, uh, God, my, don't remind me, 30 years I've been here. Moved down from Yorkshire 30 years ago, probably a bit more now. So I've been here all that time. Um, this place, I mean, it's a wonderful position, as you can see. It's a shame you can't, the, your listeners can't see it, actually, but it's a, it's a unique well, we'll get, position. We'll get some photos on. Oh, OK, yeah. cool. Um yeah, I mean it was a it was a bit of a small little bungalow, flat roof bungalow when when we moved here with trees and hedges all around it and uh, and thirty years ago, you know, it wasn't a big thing to live near Rutland Water. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a leisure resort or anything like that at the time. It was just a reservoir. It wasn't even mentioned yeah. uh, in the estate agent's blurb that it was near this. He couldn't see it, and uh, I've kind of opened it out, made the mo- made the most of it. Yeah, and and for people. Um I mean, I, I guess most people in the UK know where Rutland Water is. It's sort of fairly central. In, but for, for our overseas listeners, could you just describe where Rutland Water is, please, Rob? Yeah, definitely. Right. Well, OK, a little, little hidden part of England, Rutland, the smallest county, quite an ancient county of in England. You've got the A1 bombing down one side, the M1 bombing down the other side. It's a little forgotten place. We call it the Cotswolds without the crowds. But right slap back in the middle of this smallest county is the biggest man-made lake in Western Europe, Rutland Water. It is a reservoir, but it's a big old place. It's 20, about 26 miles of shoreline and nearly 3,500 acres of water, so it's a big lump of water. Uh, it is a reservoir, but it's a beautifully done reservoir. It looks very natural, doesn't it? They've done a good job there. And in terms of the fishing, it's predominantly fly fishing for trout, fly fishing. So that means we don't use bait, we don't use spinners, we don't use bits of metal or, or smelly bait. <laughs> we use artificial flies to entice the trout. And in terms of the fishing, it's probably, I would say, a lot of people would say, it's probably the best still water fly fishing in the UK, if not Europe. People come here from all over the place, you know. Um, in my fishing career, I've taught people from Australia, from uh, Canada, from... Uh, uh, Europe, Holland, it, it, you know, it's a wonderful place and it's uh, it's good because it is so big and it's about as wild as you're going to get yeah. for an artificial kind of man-made lake and that's why we love it. No, it, it really is it really is a nice place and, and it's, it's like a little oasis almost on, on its own, isn't it? Just just tucked in, in the smallest county in England, Rutland. Yeah. Um, just a bit, bit about, I'm dying to ask you, um, music. Obviously, music's your other passion. <laughs> Tell us about. I heard that you'd played in in the New Model Army, which was a band sort of in the eight in the early eighties, wasn't it? It, it was. Well, it, they are still going. Yeah, the, everybody talks about New Model Army. Yeah, I did play with New Model Army, but take you back to the eighties, seventies, and eighties. 
I was a I was absolute passionate drummer from the age of about twelve to sort of mid forties or whatever, uh, and it's all I wanted to do was play the drums. And I played with lots and lots of different bands, but the one that people know about because they're they're one that kind of they've done all right was New Model Army, and I joined them in nineteen eighty. Um, there were there were a three there were there were a three piece, but they'd lost the, the the original drummer, and I joined to help them out, and I was with them for about two years, and I kind of you know we did part company before they before they got signed up, so I'm the Pete Best of New Model Army if you <laughs> like, but I like I like to think that I helped them on the way, yeah. and uh, you know we were different people. They were kind of you know you, you know New Model Army. They're angry angry young men, weren't they? Well, I, you know I was quite happy actually. So, but so <laughs> could you tell that they had something special? I, I absolutely love playing with New Model Army. Justin Sullivan, the singer and the leader of the group and the creative uh, backbone of it, wrote some fantastic songs and the, the lyrics were good, the, the tunes were good. There was myself, Stuart Morrow and Justin Sullivan. Stuart was an absolutely incredible bra- bass player. Uh, and yeah, it was the, probably the best, the, the, the band I enjoyed most of all of all the bands that I p- played with uh, because they were creative um, and they had a good following and there's some great songs. I still have some tapes, actually, of some live gigs that we did in 1981 and 82. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have. And I, I still think they're good now. And, and did you do any any sort of proper recordings with them? I did demos and we did radio shows and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, it all went, it all went pear-shaped, really, because... Both Stuart and myself weren't really. Involved. I don't want to get into it, but we we we, we had differences, yeah. and I kind yeah. of moved away. Yeah. And I'd got a career by then. I'd, I'd actually got a career and a family, so it was a case of do I stay with it and and pack my job in, or and I wasn't really happy with New Model Army at the time, so I carried on with what I was doing. I still played drums with other bands. Well, I did notice as as we came through your your house, um, several rooms where there appeared to be um, various forms of percussion. There's everything down there, isn't there? Yeah. Everything, Congos, any, Congos, anything, Congos, <laughs> anything you can hit, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes they just send me in a corner to to tap on a triangle now and again. But yeah, now the story about that is, I I did do drums to death in my youth and. Before I moved down from, this was in Yorkshire, around Bradford, New Model Army from Bradford, I played. I was brought up in actually in the in the in the Wirral, uh, Ellesmere Port in Cheshire. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. So I played drums in school and I played with bands all over the clubs and stuff in the Wirral. I moved to London to play the drums after my A levels. <laughs> uh, played in a few bands down there, and then moved back to Yorkshire where my parents were at the time then. So um, I played in, in Yorkshire. But I did it to death, you know. And when I moved down here, I got a job as a designer. I was designing accessories, bags and, and luggage and that sort of thing. Uh, quite an interesting job, actually. When we, when we moved down from Yorkshire to Rutland for a job, I absolutely stopped. I fell out of love completely. I stopped playing the drums. I probably even stopped listening to music a lot because I'd done it so much. Yeah. Yeah, and then, it was a bit of an overkill, was it? It was definitely. I think it's everything I do is a little bit, you know, I go alpha leather uh, because you, you know I've, I've just taken it up again after all this time, and I've not only joined one band too, but I've joined three bands. So I'm absolutely, I'm, I do everything like to its extreme, <laughs> don't I? But the interesting thing, Bob, is that I've kind of I still play the drums. I play drums in a little covers rock band locally. But I've started playing the, the percussion, congas, tab, uh, timbales, guaro, uh, the whole thing. Because I used to go to Mexico quite a lot fishing. And I got into the Latin rhythms, the Cuban rhythms and stuff. So for me, with these new bands, when I'm playing percussion, it's a learning thing. You know, I've done the drums to death, I can do it. I wanted to play to see if I could still do it. And I still can, just about. But yeah, the percussion's a new thing. So, so it's it's a new challenge for you, it is. and um, you're learning new stuff while you're doing it, and and thoroughly enjoying it. I mean, it certainly you look, you look as though you're enjoying it. When I saw you play at Castle Bytham back in June, I am actually loving it, and I'm, I'm loving it because it is a new thing, mm. and I'm learning. And uh, not only the technique of playing the congas, but it's the rhythms. You know, it's it's totally different. It's a died in the wool rock and roller rocker yeah. playing four four to suddenly have to play. Uh, off, off the beat, you know. Yeah. It's uh, 
it's interesting. It's a learning thing. And when it happens, when it's good, a little bit of magic happens, doesn't it? I don't know. When, when we passed through one of your, your rooms, you couldn't help resist doing a bit of that reggae stuff. <laughs> I know. Well, this, this, this is the thing, the timbales as well. I was telling you earlier, wasn't I? When I first bought a pair of a set of timbales, I was hitting them all the time. But it's, it's really what you don't play, you know. You just play the odd little accent. So going back to your um, your musical career, you obviously said that you'd, you'd play with a number of other people yeah. in London. Are there any other famous names that you'd play with, perhaps, before they made it, or when, when they'd made it? i tell you what, my main claim to fame, but no, no, this is a funny story, really, but um, I went to London, hitchhiked down to London, um, and then got my drums down. I joined an all-girl band in London, rock band. An all-girl all band? Girl, apart from me. That's obviously. a challenge. Apart from me, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and we played some of the clubs, the Greyhound, Fulham Palace Road and all that, and we played... It was a good, good rock band, really. Actually, the guitarist in the band did play with the Alex Harvey band at the Palladium one time, so, you know, they were quite good musicians. But on one of the pubs we were playing at, Gary Moore was in the audience in was the he? pub. Gary Moore, you know yeah, it, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Parisian Walkway, yeah. He was Thin, thin Lizzie and he played Parisian Walkways, didn't he? And I'd seen him as as a kid and I went up and talked to him and anyway, he came on and had a jam with us. And that was a terrific experience, having somebody like that yeah. stick his guitar in, turn the amp up full and blow us away. And it was amazing, really. It was great. He, he was quite a guitarist, wasn't he? He was yeah. a really guitarist. I, I saw him about three times. I saw him yeah. with Thin Lizzy on the Black Rose tour yeah. um, in 79. Yeah. And then I saw him a couple of times at the Marquee. But wow. uh, when he went through his sort of pre-blues stage, yeah. you know. Um, I'd love to talk about the fishing. Yeah. But because it's such a nice day, yeah. um, I'm thinking, why don't we go down by the, the water's edge yeah, and talk about fishing? Yeah, it's a sunny day. There's a little bit of wind, but we're, we're, let's have a little wander. Hi, it's Pop here. Just a quick interlude. Hope you're enjoying this episode. And if you would like to hear more interesting interviews... We have over 80 episodes to date with many fascinating guests talking about a wide variety of topics which include music, history, philosophy, fitness, food and drink, adventure, contemporary culture and many, many more. I'm sure there's something that you'd really enjoy. So all you need to do is just visit undercurrentstories.com or search Undercurrent Stories in any of the podcast platforms. And now back to the show. So we've certainly chosen the right day, haven't we, Rob? It's absolutely cracking today, isn't it? Look, it's bright blue sky. Bit of a wind, as yeah. you can see. Yeah, There's yeah. some white horses on the lake now. Yeah. So we're just coming up to the, the edge of Rutland Water. Did you say we're on the um, the West Bank? We're on the North Shore, actually, north shore. Barnsdale. Yeah, yeah, so that strip of land I can see is the peninsula, the Hamilton Peninsula sticking out in the middle of the lake there. So there's water on the other side of that. But, you know, do you remember I said it was quite a special place, Rutland Water, for fishing, probably one of the best? In the country. The, yeah. the, the reason why I'm saying that really is um, it's all run by a water company, Anglian Water run it, and they stock it with trout. They put trout Do in. They? Yeah. But the thing is about this lake, there's, there's so much good natural food in there and the water quality is so good that these trout that they put in grow and they grow and grow and grow. And what sort of, what sort of size would they get to? Well, we're going to, we're Asking go, a fisherman what size the want fish to go is. Swimming, let's put it that way. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, jo- I'm joking. Uh, well, let me put it. Let me. St- yeah, brown trout. There's two types, sorts of trout in here: brown trout and rainbow trout. Brown trout live a bit longer, so they could pot- potentially get bigger. Bear in mind that they put them in at about a pound and a half. The biggest trout was caught by a, a chap from Empingham just up the road about five or six years ago. Seventeen and a half pounds, nearly. Seventeen half. Yeah, and so it's grown that big. It's yeah, not yeah. been put in that big. There are places in the country where they put them in that big and, they, and yeah. they're caught and, you know, well done, sir. Yeah. But it's been put in a big size. These fish grow to that. Um, yeah, so it's cracking. And the, the rainbows don't grow as, uh, as, don't live as long, but they can get up to five or six pounds. Yeah. Just sort of starting <laughs> off talking about fishing. I know we had a brief chat in the house, Rob. Um uh, as a kid, I did a bit of float fishing. That was about it. Fly fishing was always a little bit sort of... It seemed hard to do. What What are the main different types of fishing? And how? what was the sort of history of fly fishing, Rob? Well, like you, Bob, I started fishing in the farm ponds up in Ellesmere Port, round, uh, round Chester and that, with little farm ponds, catching little rudd and roach and golden carp. Um, 
and I gave it up when I was playing the drums. I stopped fishing. I was really passionate about fishing. I gave it up. Then when I took it up again, I wanted to do fly fishing because there's a bit more to it, I think. Um, what we're trying to do is, is trying to imitate what the fish are feeding on with an artificial, we call it a fly, but it could be anything from a, from a I don't know, from a damselfly, a daddy long legs, a, a fish, that they, they eat little fish, or a fly insect, it could be anything. Yeah. So there's that dimension that's almost like a hunt. You know, you're, you're finding out where they are, where, what depth they're at, where they want it, and what they're eating, you know, and then we've got to come up and try and present the fly in, in a natural way. And if you happen to manage to get something, it, there's no weights in between you and the fish, so it's directly, you're in direct in touch with it, and that's what I like. Right. And the fish that we tend to catch on the fly that we, that we target, trout here, and salmon, and, and uh, see, I'm a river man, really. I came down from Yorkshire as a river man, and I didn't come here for the fishing, I came here for the job I was in. And I thought, I had a preconceived idea that Rutland water was stock trout, daft trout, you stripping lures, pulling as fast as you can and catching stock stock fish. But it can't, no, it's quite clever really this this lake. You can do that, but if you you know if you go after the more naturalised, grown on fish and copy what they're feeding, you tend to catch the, the, the nicer looking fish. I mean it's going back years, fly fishing, who was it? Uh, Isaac Walton wrote a book. I can't remember the name of it now, but it's probably going back to the 1800s or something. They used to use uh, I just used to use horsehair lines or whatever and yeah. put a bit of feather on the end and try and attract the, the fish. But the main difference is we don't use bait. We don't no. use worms or maggot or, and we're always actually moving. It's quite a, 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 we're, we're moving all the time. And, and in the fishing world, is, is fly fishing considered to be sort of up, up there at the top, do you think? Well, each to his own. You know, I like it, but uh, you know, a lot of people like the bait fishing that you do, carp fishing, for example. The big, probably the the fastest growing area of fishing in the in the country, really. I, I guess why I ask that question, Rob, is 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 it probably technically the hardest and, and the hardest to achieve getting a fish? Well, if it was easy, everybody'd be doing it, and that's kind of why I said I did set up a business actually to, to you know seventeen, eighteen years ago to teach fly fishing and to take people out so yeah there's quite a bit involved there's an art to the casting of it um, and that's a wonderful thing if you can master that art even if you don't catch a fish actually. so so these people that you see with waders going in the water they're, they're fly fishing are they or can you do it from the banks you can do it from the banks uh, yeah i do all sorts of things on a boat it, definitely on a boat yeah uh, I, on rutland water particular i think i prefer fishing from a boat really they, they have little motorboats, there's about 60 boats available on here. And anybody can hire one and go off and away you go. Um, get lost up the North Arm here in the, in the wilderness and the, the nature reserve area, it's lovely. Have you seen um, an increase in interest in fishing since the, um, the White House and Bob Mortimer Bob programme, Gone go fishing. fishing? Bob and Paul go fishing, what a lovely programme that is, isn't it? It is. Do you know, I was watching it actually last night, uh, the latest one, it's just a lovely... It's not about fishing, no. is it? No, it's more about life, isn't it's it? It's life, it's two friends talking. And, but the thing about fly, certainly fly fishing, it does take you to some wonderful places, you know. I mean, I'm, I, I love my trout fishing here, um, but even more than that, I'm a passionate salmon, Atlantic salmon fisherman. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I go all over the world, actually. I go over the world. I mean, I've got Scotland and Ireland and... Um, England in the old days, I used to fish the Ribble and the Loon in Lancashire and then Scotland upon the Tweed, but you're not likely to, it's hard to catch in this country. So Atlantic few. salmon, so that's coming from the sea? Yeah, every, anything that's in the Atlantic, so we're talking eastern Canada, so I've fished in eastern Canada on a few rivers there, we're on world class rivers in eastern Canada, you've got, as I say, Scotland Island on this, this coast, Iceland, where you go, I went to Iceland last year beautiful place a fascinating place with good salmon fishing but do you know where i used to go a lot and can't go anymore we used to go to russia probably the best which, which part of russia it's uh, it's this side the the european side so we used to fly into finland uh, and get a charter up to uh, mamansk in northern russia and a, and a helicopter into the tundra in the vast area of, of tundra called the Kola Peninsula, K-O-L-A. 
cost an arm and a leg actually because I, I used to work all year for that week's fishing I used to love it and I only went as a trip of a lifetime once I was going to go be once and I loved it so much I, I went oh. and what makes it so special uh, the, the 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 rivers are beautiful. There's there's no pollution. It's wild. It's it's wilderness with armchairs because you're treated very well. Uh, and armchairs that, and vodka. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. What's not to like? And then the rivers are full of salmon, which they're not really in this country anymore. We've got pollution. We've got predators. We've got nets. We've got various things that. are that giving them a tough time. But in Russia, yeah, still still one of the last remaining places you can go and have a good chance of catching big yeah. salmon. So we're right on the bank of the of Rutland Water at the moment. Could be anywhere in the world, this. Um, hard to believe that it's it's basically a man-made lake. Um, we're coming down to some sort of, well, it looks like a beach full of boulders and stones. It's quite low. You can see it's about, it's about a yard, uh, three, about a metre meter down at the moment, a metre and a half down. This is the top water level here. Yeah. So that'll fill up in the winter. I'll um, I'll put some photos on the show notes for, for listeners just to have a look at this place. And we're looking out probably about um, 50 yards out. We've got a got a boat there. Is that a fishing boat? Yeah, I it's think it is, isn't it? It's a fishing boat, yeah. Yeah, there's a few out there today. They're all t- seeing if there are any fish out at this part of the lake. It's big, there's a big competition being run this next week, and they're all just prospecting and having a look around to see where... And, and as, a, as a sort of experienced fisherman, yeah. um, if you were wanting to go and catch some fish at the moment which part of the lake would you go to well we're just coming out of the summer bob so this the water's been very warm the very warm all 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 summer really um so there are areas in the main basin in the main area which are deeper therefore cooler and a lot of the fish have moved away from these arms we're up the we're up the north arm now it's comparatively shallow so a lot of the fish have moved away from here into the main basin and, and there are some aerators in the main basin pumping air into the water, turning it over. So that's attracting a lot of fish. Right. So if I, I think there's, a, the, there's, a, there's more head of fish over that area at the moment than there are here. But these guys are just going to see. There might be the odd big one here. So that's what they're, that's what they're here for. So when, you were, when the business was in its, in its um, prime, um, you were a licensed, or you, are you still a licensed coach? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What ha- it might be interesting to tell you how I actually ended up doing this. Uh, I'd be very interested. <laughs> I think listeners would be too, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I say, I came down from Yorkshire. I was asked to join a, a little company in in Rutland who manufactured leather goods, and I was a designer, and I I, I designed and sold. I was pretty good with customers, so I'd, I'd be looking after the Marks and Spencer account and the, and the Gap and Banana Report, the big ones all over the world, travelling all over the world. I loved it, you know. Uh, I still fished, I was a, a passionate fisherman, but uh, various things happened and I kind of didn't do that anymore. Uh, and, and I had to find something to do. So I opened my house as a and b I had four rooms down there doing B&B, very, very busy. And I took a qualification to enable me to teach. It was a level two um, casting qualification on single-handed trout, trout fishing and salmon, double-handed salmon spay casting. So I took it, passed it, created a website on my own to start with, made my own website and marketed it like mad and just sold the business, you know, sold the, got the business in. Um, and very successfully, actually. I was I kind of nearly every... Oh, probably four or five times a week I'd be having groups teaching them, taking them out I did corporate days, I did team building days I was linked to uh, oh, red letter days you know activity gift companies yes I do yeah, 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 yeah. buy a gift and that yeah. sort of thing so you get the volume, volume there and, and I did it like it was a proper job and I targeted non-fishermen who wanted the experience to do it and it, I took off, I created a monster actually and uh, so for 17 years I did that um, with the B&B as well. Funnily enough, the B&B kind of was mainly non-fishermen, um, and then people came and did one of my courses and went away in the day. And I, I, sometimes I'd be out there on the lake like these guys, thinking, "Do you know, I'm actually making a living here, uh, <laughs> sitting on a boat, yeah. just out, just out your back garden." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. what what would a typical day be for? So, so if I if I was to come along to one of your 
sort of beginner's classes. Say, say I'd got a gift. A, yeah. a gift. What, what what I do? It'd be, it'd be a day, what would I do? I'd arrive well, and then what would happen? It's all a little bit different now, I'm, I'm afraid, because, you know, lockdown happened. It changed a lot of people's views, didn't it, about work and life and, you know, quality of, quality of life and so on. So during lockdown, I couldn't do the b and I couldn't do the fishing. And when it all opened again... Got a bit older, Bob, you know, and I thought, well, actually, do I really want to do this? I don't really want to do this. So I kind of stopped the B&B and I've slowed the fishing down a lot. I used to, let's say, what, what I, oh, it, was, it was a good day. People would arrive. Uh, in the past, when I was doing it full time, I'd, we'd, we'd have cups of tea and biscuits, talk about the day. Then we'd go into my fishing cabin, which we'll have a look at later. Yeah. Uh, it's my shed, don't tell anybody <laughs> it's my shed. Uh, and have a little PowerPoint presentation and tell them all about it and teach them with some visual aids, a few jokes in there. And then you see the, so the grass field that I've got by the house there, I had an agreement with the, with the Rutland Hall that I could take people out onto that field and do the casting demonstration, t- teach them to cast. Then we'd give them lunch and take them out on a boat. What's not to like? How, how many people at a time would you coach? Well, at the time when I was doing it in BIP, uh, quite busily, I could have groups of up to 10 or 12. And you'd just be on the one boat or several no, boats? No, we'd, got, we'd, uh, we'd got two two guests plus myself, and then I'd get another boat with another guide. Another, I've got a few friends around the area, colleagues who were very good fishermen and, and nice people. You know, you don't want somebody who's just a great fisherman. No. You've got to have somebody who's a, a people person yeah. to, to make them enjoy the to help them enjoy the day. So I could get any number of boats. And, and, and as a beginner, would it, would it be you know fair to expect that they catch something on that first day? <laughs> That's the question, is it? You know, if it was easy, it'd be called catching, not fishing. It's fishing. I tell you what, it's. it's I found myself. I put myself under a lot of pressure. Actually, it was quite. Uh, it was quite stressful because I put on a. a, 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 a Play the, play the part but underneath I want you to catch a fish yeah. I so want people to catch a fish but there are things that are beyond your control so sometimes you don't catch a fish occasionally you don't most most times we, we, we and, don't and the fish in Rutland Water are they generally thrown back or, or are they used for food well it's trout fishing so we can eat one or two if you want to eat one it's the especially if the fish has been in the, the lake for a while it's a cracking fish to eat a lovely fish to eat I don't know if you've ever had a trout and it's tasted a bit earthy and yes. a bit muddy. Yes. I reckon that's straight out of the trout farm, into the water, they're, they're caught and they're eaten. Still got that trout pellet mush in, in them that they're feeding on. Yeah. But you get a trout that's been in here six months, four months, six months, it's like a salmon, I tell you, absolutely chrome, silver, solid with muscle, no fat in it, absolutely lovely fish to eat. Yeah. yeah, I think if I was a trout, I'd probably quite like living here. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why they fight so much to get off. Um, if we've got any listeners that um, are listening to this and they perhaps did a bit of fishing earlier on and, or somebody who's never done any fishing and they, and they, they really do fancy having a go, what, what advice would you give them, Rob? Um, well, what I do now, I mean, I still do a bit of fishing. I still do a bit of... Uh, I do fishing myself, but I still do a bit of helping people. And I just do, like, one-to-one or one-to-two, two-to-one on a boat... And I will start off getting you to cast. Um, there's, it's, it's, it's quite a nice little regime I've got to enable you to, to cast. I've got a couple of videos on YouTube as well. Yeah. So I could probably get you casting within about 20 minutes or so. Uh, and that's really, that's what you need to do to get the, the, the technique of actually being So able if we've got somebody line. over the other side of the world, it, you, you would recommend that they have somebody to coach them on that first bit? It would save them a lot of time, you think? I think so. I mean, I did. Uh, it was my father's friend, colleague at work up in Ellesmere Port that taught me to cast a fly. If you don't know how to do it, it's... Because uh, it's totally different to to what you've done with, your, with, your, with the float fishing. Yeah, yeah. It's totally different, yeah. I always remember ledger fishing, which was always a bit scary because you ended up sort of chucking it across the other side of the river and it would end up in a tree. Yeah, well, basically, in that kind of fishing, you've got a big lump of lead or weight or bait and basically you just throw it out there, don't you? But fly fishing, the flies that we use don't weigh anything. So we've got to perfect the technique of actually casting the fly line and therefore the fly will, will, will go with it. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. a different technique, and it's all about timing and technique rather than strength and power. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's what I do. I, 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 and the best part of the job, you know, is 
getting somebody that's never fly fish before, teaching them, taking them to a wonderful part of the world like this, and then them actually catching a fish. It just won't, and then they've got memories for it for life. The experience of fishing, would you say that um, teaching people to fish rather than fishing yourself is, is more, ta- more satisfying? It, it was, but you know, after lockdown and a, and a slow, slow down, I, I, dr- I like to go fishing myself now without the, without the, uh, the added uh, pressure of uh, wanting people to catch a fish. Yeah. You know, if I go out there, I'm not too worried if I catch a fish or not, I just enjoy it. But and you, just, you get a buzz, do you, from it? Yeah, yeah, we all like catching a fish or two, though, don't we? Yeah, but I, yeah, I still do a bit of, I do still do a lot of fishing myself, as I say, salmon fishing I do. One of my, the things I've just taken up over the last few years is I go to Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico, and fish for a fish called a tarpon with the fly. A tarpon? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, and it's probably the most difficult of, hardest fighting, the toughest fish, the most difficult to hook and to keep on fishing and that's what I kind of like doing the most difficult things and succeeded and and you've been in competitions don't do competitions actually Bob no it's not really for me no 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 no, I don't really want to test how good I don't it's not all about you you don't need to sort of test yourself against other people you just want the challenge yourself is that what you're saying not as good as they are (laughs) (laughs) there's some really good anglers out there but they are a little bit single-minded So I just kind of enjoy it. As enjoy a, it. As a yeah. Thing, yeah. That's been really good going down to the water's edge there, Rob, and, and hearing about the fishing. Um, I'm keen to know a little bit more about the, the musical side, because obviously yeah. that's another one of your fantastic passions and the painting. Yeah. We, we went past one of your paintings, which I was very oh, impressed with. Oh, is there any limit to this? <laughs> very creative. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm interested. So, so what are you doing now musically? Well, yeah, well, the story was after lockdown and, um, and re- kind of semi-retirement, really, um, I was a bit bored actually and I hadn't played drums for so long and uh, I was looking for some new direction in in life really when you're getting on knocking on a bit really and uh, I got my old drums out of the shed they'd been in there for I don't tell you how many 30 years nearly I hadn't played honestly I hadn't picked up a set of drumsticks for for so long in in public I'd obviously I still played in the house there so I got the drums out and I bought some congas because with the Mexican thing, with this tarpon fishing, very influenced by the the, the uh, Cuban Latin rhythms. Yeah. So I got some congas. And so I, would I that be some, sort of bossa nova type stuff? Salsa. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. 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 The Latin yeah. rhythm, yeah. totally different to what yeah. we're used to. Um, so, and then like everything else, I don't do things by half. I've, I've joined three bands. To keep myself busy, <laughs> run from my own back. So I've joined uh, a cracking little, a great little 25-piece soul jazz funk orchestra nearby in Uppingham in Rutland. It's a community band um, with with saxophone, trumpet, trombone, and then electric piano, electric electric. So commu- community implies to me that that you have a nucleus of people, and then other people come, and other people come, and if people can't make it, it doesn't matter. It and then is, yeah, that sounds it great. Is, it is, yeah, and they're, they're good, talented lot. Yeah. And there's a there's a good band leader who keeps us all in, 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 under control. I should imagine you need that. You do. With with Twenty five people. Absolutely, yeah. And we do the odd charity concert and church gig and yeah. festivals and things like that. And that's great fun. So we're playing Blues Brothers stuff and old soul standards and funk stuff, car wash and that. So I'm enjoying that and I'm playing congas, percussion in it. And I'm enjoying it because it's new and I'm learning and it's, uh, it's good fun. The other thing I've joined, again, playing cush- congas and percussion, a band based in Stamford called the Dancing Wooly Masters. So this, this was a band that I saw this at um, Bytham, wasn't met, it? Wasn't it? Yeah. This is how we met, yeah, at Castle What a great time that was, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, it, it, was it, it was and we had the weather as well, didn't we? Which was great. Oh, but some good bands on that yeah. day, I have to say. And I'm enjoying that because those guys are quite good musicians, very good musicians. Yeah. And it's been a long time since I've been the, the, the least able member of a band, you know? So I'm learning, they're, they're bringing me up to a good standard. So I'm learning and I'm enjoying that. And then I've also joined as a as a drummer. Got my old drum kit out, polished them up, painted over the rust, <laughs> and I'm playing in a, a rock band, a local rock band as well. So I'm enjoying so that. What, what sort of rock music is that? We're what doing, sort of songs? We're doing 70s, 80s stuff. 
We're trying to do stuff that you remember in the back of your mind, but it's been a long time since you've heard them. So like uh, all the young dudes, Mott the Hoople, oh, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, Steve Harley come up and see me, make me smile. You know, just yeah, yeah. Th- things that you love, but yeah. you've forgotten about. Yeah. So we're, we're all right. We're doing. I that. Have you got many gigs with with that band? Uh, we've we've done. We did Exonbury. You've heard of Glastonbury? Yeah, well, Exonbury. it's like it's like that, but in Exton. <laughs> <laughs> we did Exonbury. that. Yeah, and we've been. We're a bit. Uh, we're suffering from COVID. So stopping us rehearse. Some of the guys have had COVID this week, and we and we've lost a few personnel. So it, we're kind of forever rehearsing, but we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, we'll get yeah. there. We'll get there. That's great. Yeah. Any, any other projects coming up in the future, Rob? Well, yeah, let me have a think about that. <laughs> I'm going to have a little go at DJing for Rutland and Stamford Sound, I think. I might have a little go. I've been talking to the, the, the guy that runs it, Rob Pisani, and maybe having a little go at that. Um, do a bit of painting now and again. Yeah. I was thinking of joining an amateur, amateur dramatic... Thing, but to bring out the thespian in you. Whoa. Have you have you acted before? <laughs> Just act all the time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, well, you know that's, that's uh, the jury's out, really. There's, pre- there's plenty going on in the community if you dig it out, isn't there? There is, but uh, yeah, it's been uh, yeah, it's been tricky, really. Coming out of when I was, I mean, we touched on this earlier when we were just talking privately that uh, you know when you when you're sort of deep in in. Um, a relationship or a job or a career which I had it was full on here with the fishing and the B&B and then that slowed down and I'm wondering what, what, what do I do what do I do now you know you're doing this yeah. and I'm doing the drumming you've got to so I'm looking I'm looking for yeah, things yeah you, you've just got to dig things out otherwise the days can become quite yeah. um, quite long really yeah. can't they? luckily I'm, I'm quite busy I'm keeping myself active yeah. and keeping the brain going I'm learning Spanish. How about that? I'm learning. Oh, yeah. I'm learning. Is, Spanish. It, is, is that online or at a college or no, something? I'm going to a co- uh, adult learning centre in Oakham in Rutland. So I'm learning. I've been doing that for um, a couple of years now. I mean, the only bit of Spanish I know is "Dos cervezas por favor, mon amigo pay." <laughs> yeah, a very important. Yeah, one. very important. Yeah. Well, before I learned, I couldn't even say that. So, and I've just come back from Spain. I just booked a little trip. I had a car and went to northern Spain, Asturias. In there, in the mountains, and very few people speak English up there. So uh, you were fo- you were forced. I was forced to. So it is it yeah. is coming, and it, and it's good for your brain, isn't it's it? It's good for your brain. And you're doing Wordle well. in the morning as well, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I did do. I'm still, I've lost it. Yeah, that's gone by the way. Yeah. That was a bit. Yeah, it's good. For well, me. it's been really great talking to you, Rob. Um, okay. It's been great to actually come down to to where you live, right by the side of of Rutland Water. And um, I've learned a lot more about fly fishing, which is great. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, the more to it than meets the eye. There is. Yeah, if it was easy. Today's guest easy. has been Rob Waddington, owner of Rutland Fly Fishing, and you can find a link to Rutland Fly Fishing on the show notes. Thank you for coming on the show, Rob. Thank you, Bob. It's been a pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thank you. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best. 